Last week we began in this passage to look at the authority of Jesus' Word. His power in His Word. His authority in His Word. And what we saw was Jesus has just left Galilee. Galilee or he has just left Samaria, rather. And, of course, Samaria is where the Samaritans are at. And if you're trying, there's some churches today who will try to plant a church in a certain area to reach certain people. If you're trying to reach certain people, you wouldn't go to where Jesus just left. Because those were the so-called outcasts. They were the Samaritans. And yet the Bible tells us very clearly that many people believed on Him there. God blessed the ministry. God opened up hearts. And many people believed on the Lord Jesus of the Samaritans when He ministered to them. And now what we find is Jesus has left there. He has entered into Galilee. The Bible says that in verse 44 that Jesus has no honor in His home area. No honor. And then it says He's in Galilee. And what we see, the best way to understand this is this. Jesus has gone to His home area and it says that in Galilee they welcomed Him, but it was a superficial welcome of Jesus. He's, in, he's going to be in Capernaum. Capernaum, as you read in chapter 6 of the Gospel of John, they did not have real faith. They wanted signs and wonders. They wanted the bread. They did not want Jesus though. And what we saw last week was, Many times, sometimes people in your home area, the preachers, if a preacher grows up in a home area, those home people there are not going to respect his ministry. And the same thing was true for our Lord. It's wrong, it's sinful, it should not be a problem, and yet Jesus testified about this. We saw that last Sunday. And we saw that Jesus, when we do not believe his word, we do not honor him. And we saw that if we do believe His Word, His authoritative Word, we do give Him honor. It's, it, it's us coming to God, believing His Word, we give Him honor when we believe. And we looked last week, and I thought this was very helpful. Many of us here, we've had experiences with God. We're opening up the Bible, and God seems so real to us. His Spirit is working in our heart. Everything in the Bible seems real to us, and we just believe everything. God has proved Himself to us like that over and over before. But what happens when we get up in the morning and we're tired, we don't feel well, we open up the Bible and all those feelings aren't there? Well, certainly God has proved Himself in the past enough for us to know that this is God's Word and I'm going to believe it. It doesn't matter what I'm feeling like on that day. It doesn't matter the circumstances I have. I believe God. He has proved Himself to me. I'm going to honor the Son of God by believing His Word. We also saw last week, like somebody else has said in the past, that sometimes life's worst tragedies can bring about life's greatest blessings. This man was a nobleman, an official probably of King Herod. His son was about to die. Tragedy is right there. And what we saw last week was this tragedy brought on his salvation, his son's salvation, his wife's salvation, if she was alive still, his whole household's salvation. So we begin in this passage and we got to this famous statement in verse 50, if you'll look there with me. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and he went his way. We looked at how that is a definition of faith. God has spoken, therefore I believe it. And that's faith. That's what faith is. It's believing God. Today I want to continue in this passage and look at the authority of Jesus' Word. And I want us to begin in verse 51 today. And I want us to see three main things as we study God's Word together. And the first thing I want us to consider today is that believing God's Word leads God to reveal more of Himself to us. Now follow with me. You'll see what I mean. The man in verse 50 has already believed on the Lord. Or he's already believed the Word of Jesus. What Jesus has revealed to him. He has believed that. And let's begin reading now in verse 51. And as he was now going down... 
His servants met him. You see, this man was a rich man. Like it was said, tragedy meets everyone. It doesn't matter where we're at in life. Tragedy will come to us one day. This man was an official. Tragedy came to his house, though. His servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. No doubt this strengthened his faith. This was a man who had real faith. He believed the word of the Lord. But certainly secondary things help our faith at times. You may have a study Bible. You may have commentaries at home. And maybe through archaeological evidence, maybe through different supposed contradictions in the Bible that have been resolved, your faith, though you had real faith, has been strengthened through these secondary means. There's nothing wrong with that. No doubt this man, he's traveling back. He must have been some distance away. Because the time that Jesus said your son will be healed, we'll find out in the next verse, is the, is the time he goes back, he hears about this. Verse 52. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. Anytime you're reading in the Bible the seventh hour or something like that, all you do is take 7 and add it to 6 a.m. and you'll get the time. It's 1 p.m. here. And what you see, one thing that you see here is this. This is a little, this is just a little application before we go on. This man had faith, and yet this man was not afraid to ask questions about his faith. You see, the Christian faith is open to scrutiny. The Christian faith invites scrutiny. It invites open questions. You may have some very deep-seated questions in your soul. It may be about the Bible. It may be about some tragedy that happened in your past. And you've always questioned, why did God allow that to happen? The Bible invites us to scrutinize God. And I mean that in the best way possible. The Bible invites us to scrutinize our faith, to probe it, to ask questions. And people have done this for hundreds of years and they have always found this to be true, that their faith is solid. There's no holes in our faith. And the more and more you probe and the deeper and deeper you go in questioning the faith and finding true answers, the stronger your faith will be at the end of the day. I've been at places in my life, I thought I had committed the unpardonable sin. I thought I had sinned my day of grace away before my past. I thought there's no way God could forgive me. And those terrifying passages in the book of Hebrews would absolutely shake me to my core. And I had a commentary in the book of Hebrews. And I was scared to turn to those passages in that commentary. Because I thought the commentator was going to show me that I was damned. And there's no hope for my soul. But as I opened that commentary and searched the answers that plagued my soul, what I found was God helped me and God freed me. Don't be scared of the questions you have in your faith. Don't go to any source you may have out there on the internet or television or your neighbors. But go to true sources and you will find help for your questions that you have. And then look here in verse 53. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed in his whole household. Now here's the point I want to make briefly before we move on. This man began in faith at a lower level. This man began at first to believe. He's at his home country. He's traveling to see Jesus. God had given him the faith to believe that Jesus could perform a miracle and heal my son. He gets there and Jesus challenges his faith even more. Jesus says to the man and he says to the other people, he says, you won't believe unless I give you signs. And the man says, come down, come down, Jesus. And Jesus says, go, your son is healed. Your son lives. And it says the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. This man came with a certain amount of faith. He gets there. He hears the word of Jesus, the word of God spoken to him. And he leaves Jesus with a higher faith. Jesus had revealed to him this. You will have a son who lives and is healed. And the man believed that. 
And as the man was traveling on, he heard these statements from his servants. He got there, he saw his son healed, and then his faith went up. Not only up, but it appears he believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Listen, for us here today, God has revealed things to all of us in His Word. All of us. Through His Spirit, through His Word, what we are responsible to believe is not the things that are beyond us right now. It's not the things that God has not showed us or we haven't been given understanding of in His Word. We are responsible to believe the things that God has given to us today. And as we are faithful to what God has revealed us, as we are faithful to the things that God has showed us, as we believe and obey those things, God will show us more things in the Christian life. It applies like this. There, you may be here today and you feel like you have just come to a standstill in your Christian faith. You are here today and it seems like God is far away from you. It seems like your prayers go up. They hit a ceiling of brass and they come right back down to you. They just float down. They don't go any higher than the ceiling. You open up the Bible and it seems like the Bible is a dry stick, as somebody said in the past. It's a dry as a stick. Well, there could be different causes for that. But one cause is this. Has God shown you things that you know, or I know, that you know that you need to stop doing or you need to start doing, and you haven't done those things yet? If this man, when Jesus said, go, your son lives, if this man would have disbelieved him, we should not have expected a little bit later, he believed that Jesus was the Messiah. He disobeyed God when God revealed something to him. The same thing in our life. Do you have something in your life and you know for a fact the Bible and God wants you to stop that thing? Well, we should not expect to go further with God until we stop that thing. God has revealed that to us. And the more we obey, the more God reveals. Or God has revealed this to you. Not that you need to stop something, but God has revealed to you, you need to do something else. You've got a neighbor it needs to be witnessed to. It's not a hunch you have. You know God wants you to do that, and you haven't done it yet. There's something that God wants you to begin, to take up, to be faithful in, and you're yet to do that. Well, until you're faithful to the things that God has revealed to you, you should not expect God to give you more. It's like this. It's like this. You're in a dark room. You don't know where you're at. You're looking around, but you see there's a crack in a door up there. And there's a little bit of light coming through. Well, you have a few options. One of the options is this. You see that light. You don't know what's going on, but you see that light. So you begin to go closer and closer to that light. And as you get closer, the light becomes more and more. You get closer, the light becomes bigger. Finally, you're at the door. You open it. That's like God's truth. God has revealed things to us. He, he has said us, He has told us to do things or to not do things. As we begin to obey more and more, the light in our life becomes brighter and brighter. Or we're like this. We're in a dark room. There's a light, but we don't want that light because we know that light will cost us and we get further and further away from that light until it's oh so small. The things that God has revealed to us we need to believe and obey. And as we believe and obey the things that God has given to us, the light of our soul can get brighter and God reveals Himself more and more. That's the first thing I want to say to you today. The second thing I want to say is this. Look in verse 53. And this may be more of an application, but still... So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed. And his whole household. What I want us to see right now is a father's influence. And this is about a father seeking help from Jesus. This is about a father. His son is about to die. Who made the trip? A father did. Who heard the words of Jesus and believed His words? A father did. Who was the first to tell the household what Jesus did and said? The father did. Now obviously other people can do this, but in our story, this is the case. 
It was a father who heard the words of Jesus. It was a father who went because he was desperate. And though he was a great man in society, he humbled his heart to Jesus. This, this man probably that many people at this time thought was crazy. But this man was desperate. He comes to Jesus. It was a father who did this. And it was a father who led his family to believe in Jesus and to be saved. His whole household believed and was saved. You read in the Bible about household salvation, about household baptisms. Acts chapter 16, the Philippian jailer, that story there, the man's whole household believed. That's not talking about little infants being baptized. Because the Bible there says that they spoke the Word to his house. Obviously, the people there were old enough to hear the Word. And the people rejoiced together. They were old enough to believe and rejoice. But the influence that fathers have is unbelievable. And we know that. Last week, I was... Me and the girls were outside and we were playing a game. There's a, in my, in our backyard, there's a stump of a tree. And, uh, not that high, but I would put the girls on the stump and I would stand behind them and I would say, okay, fall back and let me catch you. And we had done stuff like this before, but not on a stump. So Emma's on the stump, I'm behind her and I say, okay, I'm ready, fall back. And she falls back, I catch her. Menzi and Charlotte, however, would not. I mean, three, four, five times go by, maybe. No, they don't want to do it. They're scared. And they would actually jump off forward where they can see where they're landing. Finally, Menzi gets on there. And I say, okay, I'm ready. And she falls back and I catch her. And then Charlotte gets up. I say, okay, I'm ready. And she falls back and I catch her. And I said to Menzi, Menzi, your little sister is looking up to you. She's influencing her. And the same thing's true about fathers, right? Fathers influence their family. They have such great influence. Let me ask us some questions. And if you're not a father today, you can still look at these questions in your own setting. But let me ask some questions of fathers today. Do you teach your children the Bible? Do you teach your children the Bible? And you may say, I'm not qualified to teach my children the Bible. If you are a Christian, you are qualified. God has qualified you. It may be as simple as simply sitting down and reading a chapter a night and having prayer and that's it. But that is a type of teaching the Bible to your family. You may say, it's, been so, it's either been so long since I've done anything or I've never done anything. It would be awkward if I started. It may be awkward. But it's better to be awkward, isn't it? And be disobedient to God. The Bible speaks about fathers leading their families. And I am thankful for single mothers without a husband that has to lead their family. I'm thankful for that. But that's not the perfect picture of God. It's husband and wife together. It's husbands leading families. Husbands leading spiritually. You can do this. You can do this. You may be a grandparent. And you can have, you can have ability to reach out to your grandchildren and, and touch their lives through the Bible. But are we teaching our children the Bible? Are we doing this? Is the Lord the most important person in your life? And if you say yes, would your children say yes too to that? Can our children and grandchildren, can our children say, and do they really think, that for my father, God is the most important thing. The Bible and scriptures are the most important. You say, Clint, I'm just, Brother Clint, I'm not there yet. You can be. God can help you. God can help any of us. Listen, if God gives us a command, if God gives us a command, God will give us grace. If we come to Him for help, He will give us grace to obey that command. God is good. God does not ask us something. Impossible. He doesn't ask us to cross the sea. He doesn't ask us to do something that's outrageous. He just simply asks us to do what's right. Are we doing this? I was thinking yesterday of this epidemic we have in our country. We have an epidemic in our country that families are missing Sunday morning services because of sports. 
an epidemic in this country. And you know who can put their foot down and stop this? It's fathers. It's fathers. Fathers can say, no, we will honor the Lord's day. No, I'm not going to miss Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. No, God is most important in my life and the church of Christ will not be neglected because of some gods of sports out there. No, it's not going to happen. My family will serve the Lord the best I can take care of. It's everywhere. It's all types of sports. The God of sports has taken hold of our lives. My friends, it's sin. It's sin. It's not simply a choice we do. You miss ten weeks because of sports, of Sunday mornings. It's not simply a choice that we decide to pick up or not. It's sin before God. Can you imagine what Judgment Day will be like? I don't know how it's going to be, but if God asks, why did you miss those Sundays? And you know that the answer is because I went to sports for two and a half months. It's unbelievable. Fathers have to stand up and lead the family. Fathers have to. People have to stand up and lead their family. These are the things of God, my friends. Fathers have great influence. I want to read part of the story to you today. It's from a man named Ichabod Spencer. He lived most of his life in the 1800s. He ministered at least at one time in New York State. It's a terrifying story. It's a terrifying story. He, he wrote a book many, many years ago he was a Presbyterian. He wrote a book many years ago describing the different experiences he had maybe in witnessing the people and trying to lead people to the Lord. He wrote about these. And this is one. This is a, just a terrifying story. It's about a young man who's about to die. And his father was a universalist. His father believed everybody was going to be saved. And the young man, this father's son... He's on his deathbed, and he's obviously in great, great, unimaginable discomfort. And his father says this to him, Why? You need not feel so bad. You have never done any hurt to anybody. And this is what the son replies to his father. Don't talk to me, father, said he in a tone of authority, or rather of hatred and anger. You have been my worst enemy. You have ruined me. You led me to disobey God and neglect the Bible. You led me into sin when I was only a little boy. You took me off to fish and hunt and stroll around the fields on Sundays when Mother wanted me to go to church. You told me there was no hell, that all men would be saved. And don't come here now to try to deceive me any longer. You have done your work. You have been my ruin. Oh, if I had minded mother and not you, I should not have come to such an end. Don't cry, mother. Don't cry so. He heard her sobbing, he says. The son continues. You are a good woman. You have nothing to be afraid of. God will take care of you. Don't cry so. Oh, I would give a thousand worlds if I owned them to have your religion or any part of it or anything like it. But I am lost. I am lost. You told me, Father, there was no hell, and I tried to believe it. I joined you in wickedness when I knew better. I have laughed at hell, and now hell laughs at me. God will punish sinners. He has taken hold of me. And I cannot get out of his hands. And my friends, that's a terrifying story. It really happened, bro. All of us have made mistakes as parents and leaders. None of us are sinless and we have to come back to God and ask for forgiveness. But we have such influence on our families, don't we? Such influence. 
And what we need to do, not only as a church, but as families and fathers and Christians, we need to take the long view of life. The long view. And say, what will the end be for my family if I keep leading and living this way? What's the end going to be? Jeremiah talks about, he he says something like this, the priests deal unjustly, the prophets prophesy falsely, and oh, my people love it so. And then he says, but what will the end be? It's the end. It's the end, my friend. The end is what matters. What's the end of our family going to be? What's the end when I face God on judgment? What's the end of my life going to be when I have to give an account not only for my life, but how I've influenced other people around me? What's the end going to be when I have to stand before the One who sees everything? And I would say to us today, it's not too late. It's not too late. God will help us. God will help us lead our families. God will help us lead and help our grandchildren. God will do this. All we have to do is come to Him. He will help us. He can turn ashes into beauty. He can do these things. He can resurrect life. He's the God that gives life. He is the one who can do this to us. It's not too late yet if we will turn to Him and believe and trust and follow Him. Here's the third thing I want us to see today is in verse 54. I want us to see this sign or Jesus' Word alone that healed this man. That healed this man. Verse 54, this again is the second sign Jesus did when He came out of Judea into Galilee. It says in verse 54, this again is the second sign. Listen to what chapter 11 verse 47 says. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, what shall we do for this man works many signs? Signs, I talked about this last week, signs are not necessarily bad. In fact, John's gospel in many senses is built around signs. But if all we want is signs and entertainment and we won't believe Jesus without the signs, then something's wrong. But signs in and of themselves is not wrong. But what we see here is this. Jesus performs a great sign. And what is this great sign? Jesus doesn't go to this man, this man's son, and touch him and pray and heal him. Jesus simply says the word and the man's healed. The son's healed. Now, this is the Gospel of John. John has told us in the very first verse of this Gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We know that Jesus is God already. If we turn later on toward the end of this Gospel, we'll see the soldiers coming. It's dark. The soldiers with Judas, they're coming to Jesus. And Jesus says, what do you seek? And they say, we seek Jesus the Nazarene. And Jesus says, I am. And the soldiers fall backward. We see in other Gospels, Jesus comes to a crippled man. And Jesus says, your sins are healed. And people are saying in their heart, who does this man think he is? Only God can forgive sins. We see Jesus' Word being powerful. And one thing that we see in the Bible is this. Jesus' Word is the same as God's Word. Jesus is God. As God spoke the world into existence, Jesus speaks life into dead bodies who are spiritually dead. As God spoke the world into existence, He had that power, He had that strength. The Son of God comes along and speaks life to that Son who's about to die. He will heal. He will live. And He does. Jesus is powerful. Jesus is the One. He is the One that we've been waiting for all of our lives. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, it says He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. Now listen to this. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. Now don't raise your hand, but how many of you in your heart, you felt just a little turned because you say, well, I just don't believe that. Christians can struggle with doubt, but listen friends, we need to crucify that doubt. The word of God tells us 
that by Jesus' Word, all of this universe is upheld. You said, but there's laws of science. There's gravity. There's, there's different things in our world. I don't deny all those things, but God made those things. And those things hold together and exist because of the Word of God, because of the Word of Jesus holding up the world and the universe. It is God's world. It's God's laws, my friend. Jesus is God in the flesh. And Jesus' Word imparts and gives life and gives faith. Now, I believe this man, when he came to Jesus, wanted his son to be healed. This man already had faith from God. And yet, when he was there, he said, please come down and heal my son. And Jesus says to him, go, your son lives. No doubt, Jesus' word at that moment met him with power and built his faith right there. I believe in human responsibility. I believe in free will. I believe in those things. And I also believe in God's power through His word, working mightily through His word and spirit. Friends, if you have faith today, you praise God for it. You weren't born with it. We were born sinners. If we are saved today, it's because God has come to us, been merciful to us, and He has done a work in our heart and brought us to the Son of God. And by His grace, we've believed and repented if we are saved today. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, right? The Bible says that. If you want strong faith, be strong in the Word. If you want strong faith, be strong in prayer. And if some of you here are are struggling in your life, and it's been a long time since you read or prayed, I would just exhort you very tenderly, please don't stop doing that. That's the road to apostasy. That's the road to leaving the faith. Not praying, not eating the Word of God is just like not breathing and not eating food in the natural realm. And you who have had some family members unfortunately become ill, or you have maybe you've worked in that field before, and you know when people get very sick, they stop eating, don't they? They don't want to eat. They don't want to drink. The best thing for them is to eat and drink, but they don't want to anymore. Same thing for our spiritual life. When we don't want to eat the Bible, and we don't want to drink the truths of God and pray, when we don't want these things, it's when we most desperately need these things. We desperately need these things. Because not to feed on God's Word and not to to live for Him and to pray is the road to apostasy, to falling away from God. Let me ask you this morning, have you trusted this Jesus yet? Now, I'm not asking if you've been baptized. I'm not asking if you've joined a church before. I'm not asking you if, you if you know a lot about the Bible. But this Jesus I'm describing, this Jesus we're seeing portrayed to us over and over in the Gospel of John, this Jesus who is God in the flesh, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the One who speaks and it's done. Have you trusted your soul to this Messiah yet? Not that you simply believe in Him. I have no doubt that every person in here believes in Jesus. The devil does too. But have you trusted your soul to Him yet? Have you stopped trying to save yourself by what you're doing or not doing? And have you given yourself to Jesus as your Savior and trusted Him to save you? Have you done that yet? The Word of God says this, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. If you want the life of God living inside of you, what you want to do by God's grace is to believe on the name of Jesus as your Savior and Lord. And by believing and trusting in Him like a child, the life of God comes in you. The Spirit of God comes within you. And your soul is saved. And we who have been born again and we who are Christians... This is not something simply unsaved people do. It's something that we as Christians have to do. Every day we need to feed on God's Word. It strengthens us. It helps us. It gives us life afresh and anew. Many different applications, many different things we could say now. I think the only thing I'll say though to you is this. You've heard this message. And again... 
Lord willing, we're about to leave this place in a few minutes. Take this message with you to your neighbors. Take it with you to your co-workers. Take it with you to your family. Take it with you to your waiter. And speak the words of life to them that they may be saved. And may the Lord bless us today.